The Lord be with you. I invite you to turn with me in your copy of Holy Scripture to Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 1. <clears throat> Folks tend to get sick when it goes from winter to spring in a day. I don't know if you've noticed that, but uh, I may be among their ranks. But 1 Corinthians chapter 1, we'll be reading verses 1 through 9 this morning. Paul, called to be an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God and our brother Sosthenes. To the church of God that is in Corinth, to those who are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints, together with all those who in every place call on the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, both their Lord and ours. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I give thanks to my God always for you because of the grace of God that has been given you in Christ Jesus. For in every way you have been enriched in Him, in speech and knowledge of every kind, just as the testimony of Christ has been strengthened among you. So that you are not lacking in any spiritual gift as you wait for the revealing of our Lord Christ Jesus. He will also strengthen you to the end so that you may be blameless on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful. By Him you were called into fellowship of His Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. May God bless the reading and hearing of Holy Scripture. Would you pray with me? <coughs> and now, O oh God, we pray that You speak to us through these words of Scripture, that You free our hearts and our minds from distraction that we may turn over to you even now all those things which may keep us, Lord, from what it is you have for us. May we hear your words, God, and not mine. And may those words you give us stir us to change. In the holy name of Christ our Lord we pray. Amen. Well, as most of you probably know by now, when I was growing up, I spent Monday through Friday at my mom's house, and then Friday afternoon, Dad came by after work and picked my sister and me up and took us out to his house for the weekend. Now, most of the time growing up, I was pretty excited about Friday because that meant I'd get to go out. My dad lived out in the country, uh, lived next door to my grandma, and my cousins usually spent the weekend at Grandma's house, so I get pretty excited. I even remember in Miss Stinson's kindergarten class on Fridays, we would have to draw with crayons uh, a little journal, a picture about what we were going to do over the weekend, and I'd always draw it. Daddy, Daddy didn't live in a, a red house, but I always drew a red house and a black dog, and Miss Stinson would say, what are you drawing, Chris? Oh, I get to go to Daddy's house this weekend. But as I got older, there were some weekends I didn't look forward to that Friday when Dad would pick us up. It was usually when I had done something I wasn't supposed to do on Monday or Tuesday. Maybe I got in a fight with a kid I was walking to school with. Maybe I had said something to my sister that was kind of mean. Maybe I would broken something at home. Don't know what it was. Didn't matter. My, my mom would always threaten to sort of spank us or sell us on eBay if we had it back then. Um, but the worst thing, the worst thing she would do, wait till your daddy finds out. That's what she'd say. Now, look, I know some of y'all grew up in houses where, where dad went to work during the day and mom was at home and you'd break something and mom would say, you wait till your daddy gets home. Listen, waiting till 5 o'clock ain't nothing. <laughs> when it happens on Monday and you got to wait till Friday, man, what was worse about it, you might forget. You might forget. Friday would come, dad pull up in the white company truck or his old custom deluxe. Stephanie and I, we'd go out. She'd slide in, sit in the middle because she was littler. And I was the boy, and I got to sit on the, by the window. Dad would head on down the road, maybe crack. Y'all know those little windows you had in the old trucks. He'd open that one, light a Marlboro, and just let it hang out the window for a minute. And then he'd say, so what'd y'all do at school this week? Dad didn't care what we did at school. Now, I'm not telling you my dad didn't care, but I knew. As soon as he said that, what'd you do at school this week? I knew he knew. That's all I needed to know was that he knew. Makes you nervous. Throat gets kind of <clears throat> tight. 
feel that stuff in your stomach. You swear you, you're about to get your head cut off or something. But nothing would ever happen. All it was was he knew and I knew that he knew. I can't help but wonder if, if oh, about the year 55 or 60, if some of the folks at Corinth had that same sort of feeling when the postman came by, got a letter for you, it's from Paul. Some old guy took out his knife, sliced it open, pulled it out, started reading. Oh, look, it's from Paul. Oh, and he's with Sosthenes. I could hear some folks saying, you know, oh, now, Paul, we got his picture in oil in the foyer at church. I know, Paul. I was here when preacher Paul was here. And then some of them going, well, I, don't, I didn't know Paul. I've heard of Paul. But Sosthenes, I went to school with his mama. I know Sosthenes. <laughs> Paul writes this letter. And they open it. And it reads, it starts out pretty easy. But about verse 4. Paul says, I give thanks to my God always for you because of the grace of God that has been given you in Christ Jesus. Isn't that sweet? God, Paul's thankful for us. He goes on. He says, you've been rich in every way in him, in speech and knowledge of every kind. About that time, folks would start looking down at the ground, shuffling their feet, you know, putting their hands in their pockets, looking at their watch. Maybe writing little notes, passing them to one another. If they were sitting in the sanctuary, they'd be filling in the bubbles in the hymnal. You, none of y'all do that, right? None of y'all fill in the circles in the hymnal. Because Paul was starting to pick at something. Verse 7, you are not lacking in any spiritual gift. Now everybody's looking around. Whoa, I don't know what Paul's talking about. Spiritual gifts. He knew. And they know now that Paul knew. Verse 11, we didn't read it this morning. We find out how Paul knows. Chloe's people have been telling on him. Chloe told Paul what was going on at Corinth. And what was it? Now, if you read all of, of the Corinthian letter, of 1 Corinthians, which, by the way, may not be the first actual letter of Paul to the Corinthians, but it's the first one we've got. If you read it, you know what's going on. The church, the church is in crisis. It's divided. It's divided. But it's not divided in the sort of way we may think about churches being divided. After all, they didn't have carpet to argue over the color of back then. There's nothing going on here like we may think of. There are no choirs to decide should they wear robes or not. Nobody brought a drum machine to church. Nothing like that's going on. They're divided. And what it is they're divided over are gifts, spiritual gifts. I mean, Paul winds his way to it, but he gets there. And I know why. I can understand it. You see, Corinth was a pretty diverse place. Jews, Gentiles, rich, poor, uh, working class folk, all kinds of people at Corinth. And you know, when you come to the church at Corinth, when you come to, I hope, any church, one of the things you discover is that the church it can be a great leveling place. The church can be a place where the man who, who mops the floors at the nursing home is chair of the committee on which the CEO of the hospital serves. He's over them. A man with a high school education can teach a Sunday school class with four PhDs in it. The church can be a great leveling place. And I don't, I don't doubt it was that way at Corinth. And so what happens? You know, some folks, we, we just don't like the idea that the church is where everything is the same, where everyone is on the same level. So, of course, what do we do? Well, we got to find ways to put ourselves on a little, little higher level than others. And that's what was happening at Corinth. Some were going around saying, well, well, you know, I know we're all Christians here, but I can speak in tongues. And somebody else would walk by, oh, well, well, Brother Jim Bob, it's so good that you can speak in tongues, but you know, it's no good if you don't have anybody to interpret it. I have the gift of interpretation. And somebody else might walk by, well, you know, that's all fine, y'all speaking in tongues, y'all interpreting, but it don't mean nothing if they don't know what you're talking about. See, I'm gifted. I'm a teacher. I'm gifted. And it went on like this. I'm a healer. I do this. Everybody, you know, when you make the list, if you made your own list of spiritual gifts and ranked them, it'd be funny. We'd all put ours at the top, wouldn't we? That's what they were doing. Ground was up. But it wasn't just about that. I think there was more to it, really. Because Paul even talks about in chapter 11 of this book, 
when they would gather for the Lord's Supper, the rich, the ones who could pay for folks to do all their work, they got there early in the day, sat on nice couches, turned the TV on, watched it, gathered together, said, hey, we're going to have a big dinner. Y'all come over. It's an agape meal. We're having church. I like the way they did church at Corinth, by the way. They didn't really have TVs, in case you were wondering. But they'd get together, have a big meal. Be like homecoming every week. They get to, Somebody said amen. I heard it. Okay. <laughs> I don't get another one. That's, I'm going to get that one. So they come together. Have a big meal. And, and the rich would get there early in the day, sit on the couches, eat all the food. You'd hear the whistle blow at the factory at 5 o'clock. Rest of the church, got to go home, scrub the grease out from under your nails, shake the sawdust out of your hair, put on a nice shirt, come to church. Well, I think we got a box of old stale saltines in the back. That's how it went. The ground is level in the church, but we always find ways to raise our little parcel a little bit higher. That's what Paul is getting at. And see, the people knew it. They knew it, and they knew Paul knew it right from the beginning, right in the introduction to the letter. That's what we do. Even when we say, well, we're all the same, we put a little comma and say, oh, but I'm a little bit different. I'm a little bit better. Now, I suppose, I suppose it would have been a fine letter if Paul had just spoke to that. If Paul had said, listen up, dummies, Paul's a little more tactful than I am. If he said, listen up, you all have different gifts. You're all, I mean, he actually, he says this, you know, he says, you're all part of the same body. Some of you have a gift that makes you a hand. Some of you might be a foot. Some of you may be an eye or an ear. But don't try to elevate one over the other. We need them all. Paul says we're all part of the same body. It would have been good if he ended it there. If he had just said, just be one. Just stop arguing, stop trying to make distinctions, just be unified. But he didn't. Because <coughs> unity for the sake of unity is worthless. It's pointless. I know a bunch of churches. I do right now. They all meet in the same building. When they write their checks, they all write the same name of the same church on the line. They're all in the directory right there in alphabetical order. Pictures, one, two, three, all of them right there. Some of them sit on this side. The rest of them sit over here. This side over here, guess what? Their Sunday school classes meet in the basement by themselves. These over here, they got them up in the gym, up over the floor, on the second floor. They got their own deacons. Guess what? They got their own deacons. They got designated lines in the budget. They got their, it's not the same. They all meet under the same place. They're all there together. Of course, I know of another church. Big, nice church, beautiful building, stained glass right there on the main drag in town. But you ask the people who live around it, do you know anybody that goes there? I don't know a soul. You ask the folks across town, do you know, did you know anybody? I didn't know they were still open. I thought it turned into a restaurant. I don't know. I don't, I don't know anybody. Oh, they're unified. They're in unity. But with one another to the point where nobody else gets to come in to where the doors are closed to everyone else. I don't think Paul meant that for the church at Corinth, and I'll tell you why. Even in his introduction, Paul says in verse 2, to the church of God that is in Corinth, just one of them, there are a bunch of others, church of God in Corinth, to those who are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints together with all those who serve in every place, and call on the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, both their Lord and ours. It would have been nice, I suppose, if Paul had just wrote to the Corinthians and said, y'all get along, stop acting up, love one another, stop hogging all the food, stop thinking you're better than everybody else because you can speak in tongues or whatever else, and just get along. But Paul doesn't do it there. It doesn't stop there. And I'll tell you why I believe that. The more I read Paul, the more I am convinced that for Paul, the mission of God was not about just starting little churches here and there. The more I read Paul, the more I'm convinced that for him, the mission of God was not like some giant match game where he'd flip over people from one side to the other, just flipping them over like cards and moving along. I don't think that's what Paul saw. For Paul, the mission of God was not to flip over people, but to flip over the world, to change the world. For Christ. 
And I think the folks at Corinth didn't see it that way. I think they fell into the trap that many of us fall into. That the point of all of this, the point of this time, this building uh, of singing songs, of getting dressed on Sunday, of standing and listening to somebody preach, the point of all of this is that when I close my eyes for the last time, I get to go to heaven. And I get to turn my card over. I think that's what they thought at Corinth. And so they argued among themselves, tried to put themselves above somebody else. But what they missed out, what we all seem to miss out sometimes, every once in a while, even the best among us, is that what Christ gives us, the gifts we have, even the grace and the salvation we have, is not for our own personal use. We are gifted with these things of God to change the world. To come together, not just so that we can gather in our own little corner and say, we got this all figured out, and we're good, and we're fine, and everybody else, let them figure it out. It's to change the world. And maybe it starts in our own little corner, but it doesn't stop there. It didn't stop in Corinth. Paul didn't want it to stop in Corinth. He wanted those folks going around saying, I can speak in tongues, I can prophesy, I can teach, I can preach. He wanted them to get out of Corinth. He said, fine, be a church here, but guess what? Keep going. Because gifts that are just used for me aren't gifts at all. God doesn't give me gifts just so that I can get good things and that I can be better. He does it so that when we come together and bring all of our gifts to the table, we change the world. We change the world. And we change it while we wait. That's the thing. I think we forgot that part. I think we got the waiting kind of figured out. That's what Paul says, right? Also, he says in verse 8, He will strengthen you to the end so that you may be blameless on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen you to the end. What do you need strength for if all you're doing is waiting? We're called to be involved in this. God is faithful, he says. By him you were called into this fellowship of his son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Paul has this, this notion of vocation. That is not enough. It's not just about being stamped and being called a Christian. It is a calling, not just a label. A calling into the work of the kingdom of God. To change the world with our gifts. Not just now. Not just till we're comfortable. Not till we're just satisfied that we've got all the people we like and they're all gay and they're all right and they're okay and they're right where they're supposed to be, but that we've changed the world. For that's what Christ called us to do now, tomorrow, and to the end. So let us be faithful in doing it. To not hoard our gifts to ourselves, to not use them only for our benefit or the benefit of a few but to come together with all that we have. And may we come together to change the world. For that's what we're called to do. Would you pray with me? Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, giver of the Holy Spirit, who in turn gives to us gifts of grace and gifts of the Spirit. Help us, God, to see in ourselves the gifts that you do give us, to recognize them as that gifts freely given and not earned on our own or because of some merit we have of who we are. Help us to see those gifts, God, as what they are and what you have called us to do with them. Lord, help us to bring your kingdom on earth as it is in heaven while Lord, that day comes when the fullness of that kingdom will be realized. Help us, Lord, to understand this faith and this life you call us to is not one of passivity, not one where we merely get our, our names written down, a ticket, and sit on the bleachers and wait for the end. God, one where you call us into the action to use our gifts. So, Lord, speak to us now. Show us the gift that you give us and help us to use them on our own and to come together as your church with the gifts we have to change the world. 
In your name we pray.